1848 it was called the devachan letter and in that mahatma ji had given the details about the states into which the human consciousness enters between incarnations or the post mortem states now inspired that by letter uh, inspired by that letter sinet had many questions which he posed to mahatma ji and on the same lines mahatma ji has answered those questions so i'll share my screen and we'll go through this letter number 69 okay so this letter was written uh, from mahatma k h to ap senate in july 1882 and mahatma ji mentions after receiving senate's questions he mentions that i am sincerely pleased my pupil that you should write to me as agreed whether you have or have not any special question to put to me it is impossible under your present health conditions that you should bring back to your physical brain the consciousness of higher planes of existence see sinet's way of life and his consequent health it prevented him from physically remembering any spiritual experience it is not that he was not physically uh, uh, spiritually progressing but only that he could not remember it so it is just like when a person is in deep sleep there are these states of consciousness jagrat swapna and sushupti so when he is in deep sleep a person may have experiences of the higher plane but it is not necessary that that experience will come into his waking consciousness it comes into his waking or physical consciousness only if the consciousness remains unbroken when it passes from the higher states back into the uh, lower state or in the physical state and this depends on many factors like the purity of our vehicles the physical body the astral body and the higher bodies then the kind of diet we take then what are our health conditions so due to all these factors sinet was not able to recall his spiritual experiences on the higher plane but mahatma ji is assuring him that yet remember that the sense of magnetic refreshment magnetic refreshment is the refreshment of physical memory from whatever has happened on the higher planes so the sense of magnetic refreshment is no true measure of spiritual benefit and you may even attain greater spiritual progress while your psychic development appears to stand still so this we should take note of that spiritual progress is independent of our physical memory and also independent of our psychic development psychic development pertains to mind and it uh, it's related to phenomena like telepathy or clairvoyance or extra sensory perception hpb has likened all those things to lower siddhis and those lower siddhis as one progresses on the spiritual path these lower siddhis will develop automatically but they are only mental path uh, mental powers they do not signify real spiritual growth spiritual growth happens only with the activity of our higher self on the higher mental or the buddhic planes and what happens is our consciousness becomes more aware on the buddhic plane it is not that we don't reach the buddhic plane now in our deep sleep we do reach but consciousness is not aware so when it is aware spiritual experiences take place development of intuition happens and direct knowledge is attained but all this knowledge it may not pass on to our waking consciousness when consciousness comes back to the physical plane so this spiritual growth can happen without any noticeable growth in our mental capacity or in our psychic powers then further mahatma ji goes on to answer sinet's questions he says in esoteric teachings brahma pitri and devlok are states of consciousness belonging to the various ethereal hierarchies or classes of dhyanis and pitris 
the creators and ancestors of humanity and of devas some far higher than man spiritually some among the deva classes far behind on the descending arc of evolution and only destined to reach the human stage in a future manvantar now what does the sanskrit term lok mean lok is a locality or a world or what we call in theosophy as plane so mahatma ji repeats and he stresses that in the esoteric teachings lok refers to states of consciousness it is not a place a geographical place somewhere in space but it is a state of consciousness and those states they belong to various ethereal hierarchies of beings like we are human beings we inhabit the earth the physical earth there are other beings and there are hierarchies of such beings which belong to that state of consciousness so they are said to reside or live in that lok or plane each state of consciousness or lok it may be embodied by a particular class of dhyani or deva meaning those class of dhyanis or deva they reside in that state of consciousness just like we human beings we create our own world hmm? how do we our physical world uh, generally what are we doing it is created by action you build something you do something so that is how our physical world all the buildings the bridges the things around us which are created by man that constitutes our physical world now very similarly the on the subtler levels the beings which are inhabiting those worlds the dhyanis or the devas they create their world or lok in accordance with their state of consciousness now one thing to understand they we cannot liken them to having physical bodies like us they belong to a different level of consciousness but whatever is their mode of creation through their level of consciousness they create their reality on that lok so if our consciousness rises to that level then we can perceive that reality okay in vishnu puran also uh, and hpp has mentioned this in secret doctrine she has made reference to the seven lok which we say bhu lok bhuvar lok swar lok mahar lok janah lok tapah lok and brahma lok brahma lok is also called satya lok so this brahma lok is what is regarded as the abode of brahma brahma is considered the creator of the universe so this lok brahma lok it is inhabited by the hierarchical ethereal beings who are the creators or the builders of the universe not only of the universe but everything in the universe the solar system the planetary chains so these are called dhyanis and they inhabit this highest lok called the brahma lok or the satya lok now this pitri lok it is the bhuvar lok or astral world pitri we know it is pitra means father we have our forefathers right the human ancestors whom we have similarly we also have our divine ancestors and these divine ancestors they are not gods or supernatural beings rather they are advanced spirits uh, and these spirits they came from another planet maybe a lower planet or a higher one so these advanced spirits from another and lower planet they are reborn on this planet our earth and they give birth to this round of humanity for example theosophy tells us that our lunar ancestors they came from the moon chain the highest beings of the moon chain they are our lunar an ancestors and they furnished our lower principles through their chaya that is our astral body and also in human beings uh, we have also the solar ancestors who endowed humanity with intellect but when we speak of pitri lok that is the astral world it pertains to these lunar ancestors or the lunar pitris then the third one he has mentioned is the dev lok now dev means the shining one dev are the celestial beings they may be good or bad or indifferent and it is regarded that there are 33 groups of them 
33 crore Devi Devta, that is what is said in the Hindu pantheon. But what actually it means is there are 33 groups of such beings and they inhabit the three planes which are above the physical plane. So Devas may said to be reside, to be residing in these three planes, astral, mental and buddhic. And they are categorized as Rupa Dev or Arupa Dev, depending on whether it is the uh, plane of matter by which the forms can be created or if it is a formless plane like the higher three subdivisions of mental plane and above that they are all the formless planes. So any devas residing in those planes they are arup devas and the devas residing in the lower planes that is the four lower subplanes of mental plane and astral plane they are all the rupa devas. So some hierarchies of devas, they are actually spiritually far higher than humans. Why? See, because their evolution is also going on and they have already passed the most material stage or the human stage. So they have evolved further than human and they are spiritually higher than us. Similarly, there are some hierarchies of devas who are far behind us in evolution because they are still on the descending arc of the evolution. So they will also have to pass through the human stage in future rounds or in future manvantars. Next point. Esoterically, these lokas represent Nirvan, Devachan and the astral world. So what this means, a person whose consciousness attains to Brahmalok, that person is said to have attained Nirvan. If the consciousness rises to Devlok, then the person is in Devachan. And if it reaches the Pitra Lok, that person is in the astral world or the Bhuvar Lok. The meaning of the terms Devachan and Devlok, it is identical. Chan and Lok equally signifying place or abode. Now this we have clarified, it is not a place, a geographical place or any place in space. It is a state of consciousness, which can be classified uh, by some grade of subtle matter. And the word Deva, this word too, it is indiscriminately used in Eastern writings and is at times merely a blind. So this you will find in the Indian scriptures. In mostly all places, the word Deva is used to refer to any being. You will be right in referring the real knowledge and true cause of the verses quoted to the highest plane of spiritual enlightenment. The greater darkness into which the perfected Siddha is finally merged thereby is that absolute darkness, which is absolute light. Now, Mahatma Ji is here referring to some verses. These are the verses of Isha Vasya Upanishad. And specifically, they are the verse numbers 9 to 14. So these verses, they speak about what is real knowledge, what is ignorance and who attains it. This we have even when we see, when we are studying anything, this knowledge which is being given to us, the theosophical knowledge, this we are understanding it and comprehending it with our mind. This is called a paravidya. Okay? And there is something called as paravidya, which is beyond the mind. You cannot comprehend it by the mind. So there are different kinds of knowledge, paravidya, aparavidya, what is real knowledge or real vidya and what is the meaning of ignorance. So all this has been uh, delineated, uh, delineated through these verses of the Isha Vasya Upanishad. And it also tells us about the first cause of the universe. So this knowledge is actually the spiritual enlightenment which the adepts are able to attain. They are the perfected beings and they are in the stages of highest consciousness. That is the highest plane. That is what Mahatma Ji is saying that you can liken it to the highest uh, spiritual enlightenment. The consciousness of such spiritually enlightened persons, it can be thought to have merged with absolute darkness. So this would be a paravidya, absolute darkness, which means paranishpanna. This word has come in theosophical literature. Absolute darkness, 
which we can liken it to para nishpanna which means beyond manifestation which means the universal maha pralaya so because the everything is latent or unawakened but it is there in that universal maha pralaya so light is also not there it is lying in that maha pralaya it is unawakened so that's why it can be called as absolute darkness then in this book the stanzas of dhyan the fifth stanza says that darkness alone filled the boundless all that means at the time of the universal maha pralaya everything is latent everything is sleeping within that boundless all and darkness alone filled now there is no other word to use that is why this word darkness has been used absolute darkness which is also absolute light because it contains everything everything is lying latent in it whether it is the spirit or substance or cosmos they are all unawakened inside this absolute darkness space time motion the monad the ego the person so all these grades these hierarchies which manifest to form the physical universe they are all inside this absolute darkness that is why it is also called absolute light because it is the ocean of knowledge also knowledge which is still latent the real knowledge here spoken of is not a mental but a spiritual state see so it is beyond mental para vidya the real knowledge here spoken of is not a mental but a spiritual state implying full union between the knower and the known now mark the words very carefully full union between the knower and known so as we said earlier real knowledge it cannot be cognized by the mind mind is our individual ego it is the atma buddhi manas it gives the feeling of separateness hmm? so there will always be separation between the knower and the known we will say i know something i have learned something so this i is separate from the something that is known or that is learned but the spiritual state in which there is real knowledge in that state there is no separation between the knower and known there is complete union of the consciousness of the knower and known complete union of consciousness that is see these are only words but we need to actually contemplate on it how the knower and known can become one now this in this spiritually enlightened state the mind is transcended and this is what signifies this union because mind is the separating factor the what you can say it causes the notion of individual ego atma buddhi manas is the individuality the reincarnating individuality but when mind is transcended and the consciousness rises higher when it rises higher it is at the level of atma buddhi the monad and these are universal principles so naturally any other object or being which is also endowed with this divine consciousness that is also a universal principle so there is no boundary no separation that is what is meant by universal principle but mind it will give us a separateness so that is what is implied by union between the knower and known these are uh, if we study the spiritual literature uh, in patanjali's yog sutra and all we will come across these technical terms of sampragyat samadhi and asampragyat samadhi these are all nothing but these states which are being mentioned here so this was a very small letter this letter number 69 and it gets completed here then after this we move on to the letter number 70 a b and c the chronological series and in the barker series it is mahatma letter number 20 a b and c so this uh, letter number 20 a is actually questions from a o hume to mahatma k h and letter number 70 b they are 
questions from AP Senate to Madam Blavatsky. And then in letter number 70C, Mahatma KH has given replies to all these questions, but he has addressed the letter to AP Senate. Now, all these letters were received in August of 1882. Okay, And I'll give you a little background about these letters so you will understand why the questions came up and what is the context of these letters. So what happened that in October 1881, now see these three letters, 70 ABC, they were written in August 1882. So in the previous year, in October 1881, an article on death, it was published in the magazine, The Theosophist. And that article was by Eliphas Levi. We know Eliphas Levi, his name has come several times in uh, Secret Doctrine also. Madame Blavatsky referred him a lot. He was a French esotericist and he had this great knowledge about occultism and he had written several books on magic and alchemy and Kabbalah and occultism. So uh, something which he, an article about death, which he had written, this person, Eliphas Levi, that was published in the Theosophist. Now, Eliphas Levi, he was not living at the time. He lived between uh, 1810 to 1875. So he passed away in 1875 and actually our Theosophical Society came into being. It was founded in 1875. So much later, that is after his death, one of his articles was published. And then, uh, so this Theosophist magazine, it was a means of communication. HPB and so many other people also, members of that time, they would write their thoughts and articles and uh, they would also be question answers. And based on that, many times Mahatmas would reply to the doubts or to the answers. And this is how knowledge was being disseminated. So one of the member, N.D. Khandalawala, uh, he wrote to Madam Blavatsky. He pointed out some seeming contradictions and he was seeking clarifications between uh, Madam Blavatsky had written some footnotes for this Eliphas Levi's article on death. And also there was another article from the series Fragments of Occult Truth. Both the articles were in the same magazine, The Theosophist. So he found some contradictions and he asked some questions. So Madam Blavatsky sent uh, Mr. Khandalawala's letter to Mahatma K.H. And instead of replying to that, Mahatma K.H. sent a note back to Madam Blavatsky saying that Sinet has now received all the necessary explanations because Mahatma Ji was uh, having this personal communication, sending letters to Sinet, in which he was giving him the teachings to Sinet. So all those questions which Khandalawala had, Sinet would be in a position to answer them. So Mahatma Ji asks him this personal favor. Let Sinet enlighten his brother Theosophist by writing an answer for this. And he can sign it as a lay chela. This is the note Mahatma Ji sent to Madam Blavatsky. Now, See here one more thing, what we can get from this. In that book, uh, At the Feet of the Master, Mahatma Ji writes that if you know, it is your duty to help others know. And that is exactly what he's telling Sinet, that you have been given so much knowledge, you are in a position now to answer and clarify the doubts of your fellow, of your fellow member. So HPP forwarded this note and Khandalawala's letter to Sinet. And so now Sinet, um, he understands that now he is supposed to answer these questions. So he goes to A.O. Hume at Shimla to discuss this matter. And Hume was writing these uh, the series of articles on fragments, that is uh, fragments of occult truth. So when uh, A.O. Hume reads all those letters and the back and forth the messages which are passed. He also has some questions which he writes to Mahatma K.H. So Hume's letter became letter number 70A. And then Sinet wrote to Madame Blavatsky to clarify some points which were raised by Mr. Khandalawala. So that letter became 70B from Sinet to Madame Blavatsky. And then HBB referred Sinet's letter to Mahatma K.H. And then Mahatma replied to both of them that became letter number 70C. So if we read these or go through these letters serially one by one, they will be very confusing because the first two letters A and B, they only have questions. 
and then in letter C are all the answers. So I have arranged the slides in such a way. I have taken letter number 70C, that is the replies from the Mahatma, that is taken as the base. And based on each answer that is given, we have taken up the question from the relevant letter, either from A or from B. So that is how I propose to proceed on these three letters. So we'll go to the first one. So here, the first part of what uh, Mahatma KH has written, that is the reply to this question from Sinet. Sinet had written, of course, we have received no information that distinctly covers the question now raised. He's referring to the questions raised by Mr. Khandalawala. And Mahatma Ji had mentioned Sinet has enough information, he can write the replies. But Sinet is saying, of course, we have received no information that distinctly covers the questions now raised by Khandalawala. Though I suppose we ought to be able to combine bits into an answer. The difficulty turns on giving the real explanation of Eliphas Levi's enigma in your note in the October Theosophist. So this is, Sinet is referring that he is having difficulty due to the footnote which Madame Blavatsky had written under Eliphas Levi's article. And he was not able to comprehend that footnote. He writes that if he refers to the fate of this at present existing race of mankind, his statements that the intermediate majority of egos are ejected from nature or annihilated would be in direct conflict with KH's teachings. So if Eliphaz Lavais is referring to this, to the present existing race of mankind, then he is in conflict with Mahatma KH. This is uh, Sinet's doubt. The theosophical teaching, according to what we have studied, it says that the upper triad or the Atma Buddhi Manas, that is the real immortal man. It is regarded as the reincarnating ego, which takes on new personality with every reincarnation. So in her footnote to Eliphas Levi's article, Madame Blavatsky had mentioned, it is but the useless drones. I'm quoting from her footnote. Uh, Madame Blavatsky had written, it is but the useless drones which she gets rid of, violently ejecting and making them perish by the millions as self-conscious entities. So that means after death, what is happening? The useless drones, nature gets rid of them, violently ejecting and making them perish by the millions as self-conscious entities. This is what Madame Blavatsky wrote to explain uh, that article on death. And Sinet did not understand this. Sinet thinks that this is in contradiction to Mahatma KH's teachings, which says that ego is the real immortal man. So if that e ego is immortal, then how can the nature get rid of these useless drones and make them perish by the millions? So the point being missed here is that nature makes them perish by the millions as self-conscious entities. This word, self-conscious, that is important. To perish means self-consciousness of the ego does not remain unbroken from one incarnation to the next. Generally, when a person is born, he doesn't remember his previous life. So there is a gap, there is a break in his self-consciousness. Self-consciousness means to know that I am I. Okay, it's reflective. I am I, whatever your identity may be. So that is broken. There's a gap in the next incarnation that is not remembered. So this is the meaning. It is as good as whoever is the previous entity or the previous person who was living, he has perished forever because the remembrance of his self-identity is no longer there with the ego in the next incarnation. So this, like I try to explain with an example, suppose if you think of a person who was born as Mr. Singh and then after his physical death, that same ego, that is the Atma Buddhi Manas, which was uh, having this personality of Mr. Singh, he is now reincarnated as Mr. Joseph. So Mr. Joseph is the new personality. Now this reincarnated ego, 
Atma Buddhi Manas, it has no recollection or self consciousness that he was the same as Mr. Singh. This means that the self consciousness of the ego is not unbroken, it is not continuous from one incarnation to the next. And this is as good as being annihilated. So when he is saying that, uh, where is it? Nature, the intermediate majority of egos are ejected from nature or annihilated. That is with respect to the self-consciousness of the ego. That is what is annihilated. And But the immortality of that individuality, that remains. And yes, so that is it. These egos are the intermediate between what? The term that is used, uh, intermediate egos, right? His statement that the intermediate majority of egos. So we need to pay attention to each and every word. Intermediate majority of egos. That, is, that means the general man, the average mankind. That means instead of these intermediate, there should be um, the poles, the upper pole and the higher pole. So these poles are the adepts who are the brothers of light. They also have this uh, feature, the ego, Atma, Buddhi, Manas. And the other pole is the brothers of shadow. So one is spiritually immortal and the other is immortal and evil. We will see that later on how this happens. But these are the two ends, the extreme ends. The immortal in good, which is the adept, and the immortal in evil, which is the brothers of shadow. And in between them is this intermediate mankind, the intermediate egos who perish because they lose their self-consciousness. That is why they are considered as annihilated. Whereas the adept is considered immortal because his continuity of his uh, self-consciousness remains. And same goes also for the brother of shadow. How that is, that will come further in the letter. Now, next. So this is a continuation of Sinet's letter. Sinet writes, they do not die without remembrance. If they retain remembrance in Devachan and again recover remembrance, even of past personalities as of a book's pages at the period of full individual consciousness preceding that of absolute consciousness in Parinirvana. So uh, Eliphas Levi had written that to be immortal in good. Now this again I am quoting from Eliphas Levi's article. He had written to be immortal in good, one must identify oneself with God, to be immortal in evil with Satan. So either identify yourself fully with God, that is good, you are immortal in good, or identify yourself fully with evil. So that is immortality in evil. Further, these are the two poles of the world of souls. These are the two poles of the world of souls. Soul is Atma Puti Manas. Between these two poles vegetate and die without remembrance the useless portion of mankind. So between the adepts and between these uh, evil brothers of, uh, brothers of shadow, between these two poles vegetate and die without remembrance the useless portion of mankind. Meaning the average man who is neither an adept nor is he totally evil. So they vegetate and die. So for this particular sentence, Sinet had written that they do not die without remembrance. That means general people like us, they do not die without remembrance. And if they retain remembrance in Devachan, and they again recover uh, this, they again recover remembrance at the period of full individual consciousness, which happens at the time of Parinirvana. So how can this statement be true? That is Sinet's question. Okay. So what happens in this world of souls? The higher pole, as we said, it is the brothers of light or the adepts. So that is one extreme. The soul can attain that level that they are immortal in good. And the other pole, the opposite pole, it is the uh, brothers of shadow. They are the sorcerers of evil. Now, both are initiates. Okay, so understand this. Both are initiates and both have reached the pinnacle of knowledge. Both have reached the highest knowledge possible. 
but one is applying it for good and the other is applying it for bad that is what makes them either adept or a sorcerer and both are able to maintain an unbroken self consciousness throughout the complete cycle that is why they are called immortal okay that is not the case for average people like us after one particular incarnation when um, the ego moves into the world of effects then it forgets the previous incarnation it is born in a new personality so we do not retain this self consciousness but the the souls which belong to these two poles either adept or to the brothers of shadow they are able to retain the self consciousness throughout the complete cycle that is why they are called immortal and between these poles the rest of the egos they die without remembrance to die without remembrance means there is a gap in their self consciousness from one birth to the next they do not remember that they are the same personality sorry the same individuality which is incarnating in successive personalities so sinet argues that no that is not the case they do remember this remembrance comes in the devachanic state and also just before the parinirvana parinirvana we just saw what it is hpb has explained parinirvana esoterically means para nirvana para means that which is beyond so that state which is beyond the nirvanic state that is para nirvana and nirvana can be reached during a man's life he can become a jivan mukt he can attain nirvana in this very life itself and after his death in the corresponding manvantar in the current manvantar and this para nirvana that once he has attained nirvana then para nirvana or beyond nirvana is reached only during the night of the universe that is what hpb mentioned that means only during the universal maha pralaya during that stage it is called para nirvana because it goes beyond manifestation nirvana is obtained at the time of manifestation during this manvantar so the rest of the manvantar that being won't have to incarnate but when all the manvantar the maha manvantar is also over then after that the state that is called para nirvana or pari nirvana so um, and during that time everything just merges into the state of pralaya so this was sinet's doubt that just before para nirvana each ego has a full individual consciousness of all his past personalities that is a fact it is also mentioned in theosophic literature that before that para nirvana before that stage happens all the egos will have this full individual recollection of the past personalities so then how can it be said that they die without remembrance so these are the questions he has written in his letter 70b the next point he writes but it occurred to me that eliphas levi may have been dealing with humanity as a whole not merely with the fourth round men great number of fifth round personalities are destined to perish i understood i understand and these might be his intermediate useless portion of mankind so <laughs> this was sinet's understanding now you see what we discussed that the useless portion of mankind it was it is actually between the two poles of the adepts and the brothers of shadows okay and this middle portion of mankind they don't remember they have a gap in their self consciousness but what sinet understood he thinks that it might be the great number of fifth round personalities so he is trying to find a plausible answer that uh, eliphas levi is not referring to fourth round men he is referring to fifth round personalities who have appeared in advance in this fourth round and they might be the useless portion of mankind so you see the kind of thinking what knowledge is being given what articles are being written and based on that what is the contemplation going on in the mind of sinet what plausible answers he is finding and so many things may not be right now even this what we have discussed over here this we have gathered from our theosophic literature but maybe if we go into deeper contemplation there might be more answers to it so let us see further what he says so he says this is again sinet continuing in his letter 70b but then the individual spiritual monads as i understand the matter do not perish whatever happens 
and if a monad reaches the fifth round with all his previous personalities preserved in the pages of his book awaiting future perusal he would not be ejected and annihilated because some of his fifth round pages were unfit for publication so again there is a difficulty in reconciling the two statements so whatever plausible answer he was trying to find about the fifth round personalities that is still not plausible uh, his doubt is uh, not resolved because even if there were the fifth round personalities that were that uh, eliphas levi was referring to still their monads that means their atma buddhi that cannot perish so they cannot be annihilated and even if suppose they did not lead a good life in some incarnation so even if that incarnation was a waste still the atma buddhi is imperishable for everyone so how can they be annihilated now to all of these all of these questions the mahatma ji has answered he begins his letter with that that is letter 70c perhaps there is time for one or two answers and then we can stop and we'll do the rest in the next session so mahatma ji answers to sinet's question except in so far that he constantly uses the term god and christ he meaning eliphas levi in his article death so he uses constantly the term god and christ which taken in their esoteric sense simply means good in its dual aspect of the abstract and the concrete and nothing more dogmatic eliphas levi is not in any direct conflict with our teachings so at the outset of his letter mahatma th is clarifying that eliphas levi's article is not in direct conflict with the wisdom teachings it may seem dogmatic because he uses the term god and christ but what is their meaning he has used the term god to express the abstract idea of goodness and he uses the term christ which stands for the concrete idea of goodness so goodness it's just one notion but if you look at it in abstract terms you can refer to it as god and if you look at it as a manifested goodness because jesus christ so jesus incarnated as everything that was good he was an incarnation of love so that christ stands for the concrete the manifested idea of goodness that is the only difference otherwise there is no direct conflict most of those whom you may call if you like candidates for devachan die and are reborn in the kamlok without remembrance so see mahatma ji is clearly mentioning they die and they are reborn in the kamlok without remembrance it is not that they remember though and just because they do get back of uh, some of it back in the devachan nor can we call it a full but only a partial remembrance so upon physical death now see we are again moving into those states the post mortem states a lot of it was already covered in the previous letter 68 so upon physical death all physical memory it is lost forever and even the spiritual memory it is lost for the time being for a certain time the lower manas which gets assimilated with kam so it separates from the higher self there is a separation between the higher self and the lower principles so this lower principles together with whatever manas was enmeshed in kam so that formed the lower manas so that creates or forms the kam roop and this is the meaning to be reborn in kam lok to be reborn in kam lok that is when the higher and the lower principles separate only after that the kam roop is formed never before never in life never during life but the kam roop has no memory of the life which has just closed the physical life which had and this kam roop is merely a shell because the principle of kam is there which is galvanized by the lower manas so the shell will have tendencies which are same as the person who had lived but otherwise it doesn't have any intelligence it is the atma buddhi and the assimilated higher manas that goes into gestation 
and that atma buddhi manas it enters later into devachan so at this point this higher self or the atma buddhi manas it not only remembers when it is in devachan it not only remembers its near and dear ones along with all the happy memories but it also finds them to be present with him right there in that state and all these happy memories that uh, the higher self will have in devachan but it will not have any of the unpleasant or unhappy memories because in devachan he is reaping the reward of his good karma so any unpleasant or miserable memories they cannot come there because otherwise it will not be devachan so that is why even the remembrance in devachan that is considered as partial not full and for the kamrup we know it doesn't have any actual intelligence it is just the tendencies of the personality so this is what mahatma ji meant that uh, that person he dies and is born in the kamlok without remembrance so i'll take one more slide and then this is the slide after this we will stop you would hardly call remembrance a dream of yours some particular scene or scenes within whose narrow limits you would find enclosed a few persons those whom you loved best with an undying love that holy feeling that alone survives and not the slightest recollection of any other events or scenes so this he is talking about devachan it is a very limited memory and it is more like a dream rather than an actual remembrance Uh, because that person or that individuality is able to remember only the most loving moments with the most loved people and only selective memories he recalls so this cannot be called remembrance in the true sense of the life which has just closed love and hatred are the only immortal feelings that means uh, see love and hatred they are emotions that means they are vibrations of energy so this vibration which is generated by the feeling of love or hate that is what lasts throughout the cycle of manifestation that is why it is called immortal feelings those vibrations will last throughout the cycle the these uh, immortal feelings they are the only survivors from the wreck of d sorry yi dhamma yi dhamma is the phenomenal world so from this phenomenal world the personality and everything all the material lower material uh, this what uh, personality it perishes but these feelings of love and hatred love also and hate also they are the only surviving things from this phenomenal world and uh, imagine yourself then in devachan with those you may have loved with such immortal love with the familiar shadowy scenes connected with them for a background and a perfect blank for everything else relating to your interior social political literary and social life so these are the only immortal feelings love is the only feeling which is relived in devachan not hatred because reaping the rewards of good karma is only love those whom we love most dearly they appear to be there and they appear in the same familiar backdrops although those backdrops are hazy the events which uh, with they are connected those same things are experienced in the state of devachan and nothing else of the life that is the social political literally social life whatever else that person might have experienced during his lifetime that does not come up is not remembered in devachan so with this we will uh, close this session today and i now invite uh, minakshi ji to give the translation in hindi namaste thank you sister aaj hum letter number 69 70 a b or c le rahe hain chronological letter number 69 yaha patra master ke h ap senate ko july 6 1882 mein likhte hain मास्टर कहते हैं मेरे शिष्य आपको चाहे मेरे लिए कोई विशेष प्रश्न हो या न हो फिर भी वादे अनुसार आपने मुझे पत्र लिखा मैं प्रसन्न हूँ 
अभी आपके स्वास्थ्य की स्थिति के तहत आपके मस्तिष्क में उच्चतर स्तरों की चेतना को वापस लाना असंभव है फिर भी यह याद रखें कि स्मृति का पुनर्जीवन यह आध्यात्मिकता के लाभ के लिए सही उपाय नहीं है आप आपके सिद्धियों का विकास स्थगित हुआ ऐसा प्रतीत होने पर भी आप अत्यधिक आत्मिक उन्नति कर सकते हैं सिनेट का प्र, आ, के प्रश्न पर मास्टर कहते हैं गुढ़ विद्या में ब्रह्म पितृ और देवलोक यह विभिन्न इथेरियल हरकिज या ध्यानियों और पितरियों और देवों के वर्गों से संबंधित चेतना की अवस्थाएं हैं देव वर्ग में कुछ आध्यात्मिक रूप से मनुष्य से भी बहुत उन्नत प्रगत है तो कुछ बहुत पीछे है वे विकास क्रम में अधोगामी है और जो भावी मनवंतर में मनुष्यत्व प्राप्त करेंगे सामान्यतः यह लोग निर्वाण देवाचन और भुवर लोक दर्शाते हैं देवाचन और देवलोक का अर्थ समान है चन या लोक स्थान या निवास को दर्शाते हैं पौर्वात्य ग्रंथों में लेखन ग्रंथों में देव इस शब्द को स्वैरता से उपयोग में लाया गया है बहुतांश यह अविचारता पूर्ण है आगे मास्टर कहते हैं कि आप आत्म साक्षात्कार के उच्चतम स्तर पर जो ईशा वासोपनिषद में उल्लेखित छंदों के पराविद्या रियल नॉलेज और ट्रू कॉज का उल्लेख करने में सही होगी वह संपूर्ण अंधकार जिसमें एक परिपूर्ण सिद्ध अंततः विलीन हो जाता है वह परम अंधकार ही परम प्रकाश है अप, आ, जिसे सिस्टर आ, ने कहा है अपराविद्या यह उल्लेखित पराविद्या कोई मानसिक स्थिति नहीं बल्कि आध्यात्मिक स्थिति है जो ज्ञाता और ज्ञेय की पूर्ण एकरूपता को दर्शाते हैं आगे हम क्रोनोलॉजिकल लेटर नंबर सेवेंटी ए बी सी में आते हैं जो कि प्रश्न उत्तर फॉर्म ने हमने लिया है इस पर एक नोट है कि अक्टूबर 1881 के द थियोसॉफिस्ट के अंक में एलिफा लेवी लेवी का डेथ पर एक लेख प्रकाशित हुआ यह लेख चर्चा और मतभेद का विषय बना थियोसॉफिकल सोसाइटी के एक सदस्य एन डी खंडालावाला ने यह दर्शाते हुए एडिटर को लिखा कि द थियोसॉफिस्ट के उसी अंक में फ्रेगमेंट्स ऑफ ओपल ट्रूथ की आ, आर्टिकल्स की सीरीज का एक लेख एलिफास लेवी के आर्टिकल के साथ एडिटर के नोट में किए गए कथन के विरोधाभास में उन्हें उसमें कुछ अपूर्णता दिखी और उन्होंने स्पष्टीकरण मांगा एचपीबी को मिस्टर खंडाला वाला का पत्र मिलने पर उन्होंने उस पत्र को मास्टर के एच को भेजा मास्टर के एच ने एक प्रेसिपिटेटेड नोट के साथ उस पत्र को एचपीबी को वापस भेज दिया वह इस प्रकार से है इसे आप मिस्टर सिनेट को भेजें। मुझसे सभी आवश्यक स्पष्टीकरण मिलने के बाद वह अपने साथी सदस्यों को अगले थियोसॉफिस्ट अंक में उनके प्रश्नों के उत्तर देकर उन्हें लाभान्वित करे और अलेचेला से हस्ताक्षरित करे एच पी बी मिस्टर खंडाला वाला का पत्र मास्टर के एच के नोट सहित सिनेट को भेजती है इस बात पर वे मिस्टर ह्यूम के साथ चर्चा करने जाते हैं इससे मिस्टर ह्यूम के मन में फ्रैगमेंट्स के लेखों की श्रृंखला में एक लेख के बारे में जिसे वह लिख रहे थे उस पर सवाल उठते हैं और वे मास्टर के एच को पत्र लिखते हैं जो कि क्रोनोलॉजिकल लेटर नंबर सेवेंटी ए है फिर मिस्टर सिनेट मिस्टर खंडाला वाला के पत्र के कुछ पॉइंट्स को स्पष्ट करने के प्रयास में एचपीबी को लिखते हैं यह क्रोनोलॉजिकल लेटर नंबर सेवेंटी बी है इस पत्र को एचपीबी मास्टर के एच को भेजती है मास्टर के एच सिनेट और ह्यूम दोनों के पत्रों का उत्तर सिनेट के पत्र के पीछे लिखते हैं लेटर नंबर सेवेंटी बी में सिनेट लिखते हैं मैंने तुरंत 
खंडाला वाला के पत्र का जवाब देने की कोशिश की है ताकि के एच के नोट में कहे अनुसार उसे अगस्त के थियोसॉफिस्ट में छापा जा सके लेकिन मैं उलझन में पड़ गया जो प्रश्न उठा है उसके ऊपर हमें निश्चित ही कोई जानकारी नहीं मिली हालांकि हम कुछ अंशों को मिलाकर उत्तर दे सकते हैं अक्टूबर के द थियोसॉफिस्ट में आपके नोट में एलिफस लेवी के पेचिदा बातों पर सटीक स्पष्टीकरण देने में कठिनाई होती है यदि वह अपने लेख में वर्तमान के मानव जाति की रेस के भवितव्य का संदर्भ दे रहे कि बहुतांश मध्यवर्ती जीवात्माएं सृष्टि से बेदखल होती है या मिटा दी जाती है तब यह के एच के शिक्षण के परस्पर विरोध में है वे बिना स्मृति के मरते नहीं है यदि वे देवाचन में स्मृति बनाए रखते हैं और फिर से परिनिर्वाण में पूर्ण चेतना से पूर्व पूर्ण चेतना को पुनः प्राप्त करते हैं लेकिन मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि एलिफास लेवी केवल फोर्थ राउंड के मनुष्य की नहीं बल्कि पूरी मानवता के बारे में बात कर रहे हैं मैं समझता हूं कि पांचवें राउंड के व्यक्तित्वों का बड़ी संख्या में विनाश होना तय है और यही एलिफास लेवी के मध्यवर्ती सामान्य मानव जाति का हिस्सा होगा लेकिन जैसा कि मैं इस बात को समझता हूँ प्रत्येक स्पिरिचुअल मोनाड चाहे जो हो वह नष्ट नहीं होता है और एक मोनाड अपने संपूर्ण पिछले व्यक्तिमत्व सहित जो भविष्य में अवलोकन की प्रतीक्षा में उसके जीवन किताब में संरक्षित है वह यदि पांचवे राउंड में पहुंचता है तब उसे निष्कासित और नष्ट नहीं किया जाएगा क्योंकि उसके पांचवे राउंड के कुछ पन्ने प्रकाशन के लिए अयोग्य थे इसीलिए पुनः दोनों कथनों की सुसंगति करने में कठिनाई है इस पर मास्टर आंसर सेवेंटी सी में उसका उत्तर देते हैं एलिफस लेवी हमेशा गॉड और क्राइस्ट शब्दों का उपयोग करते हैं जो उनके गुढ़ अर्थों में लिया जाए तो उसके अमूर्त और मूर्त दोनों पहलू में दयावान यह अर्थ है यह धर्म संबंधी नहीं है सिवाय इसके एलिफास लेवी का हमारे सिद्धांतों से कोई सीधा टकराव विरोध नहीं है जिन्हें आप चाहे तो देवाचन के उम्मीदवार कह सकते हैं उनमें से अधिकांश की मृत्यु होती है और वे बिना स्मरण के काम लोक में पुनः जन्माते हैं हालांकि वे इसे थोड़ी मात्रा में देवाचन में वापस प्राप्त कर सकते हैं हम इसे पूर्ण स्मरण नहीं बल्कि केवल आंशिक स्मृति कह सकते हैं कुछ विशेष दृश्य या दृश्यों जिनकी मर्यादित सीमाओं क्षेत्र के भीतर आप कुछ ऐसे व्यक्तियों को पाएंगे जिनसे आपको बहुत स्नेह था अपार प्रेम था केवल वही पवित्र भावना बची रहेगी कोई अन्य घटनाएं या दृश्य की जरा सी भी याद नहीं रहेगी प्रेम और घृणा ही एकमात्र अमिट भावनाएं हैं जो एकमात्र ये दमा या सांसारिक जगत के अवशेष से बचे हैं कल्पना करें कि आप देवाचन में उन लोगों के साथ हैं जिनमें आपने अमिट प्रेम से स्नेह किया था पृष्ठभूमि में उनके साथ जुड़े परिचित छायारूप दृश्य है और आपके आंतरिक सामाजिक राजनीतिक साहित्यिक और सामाजिक जीवन से संबंधित पूर्ण रिक्तता है थैंक यू मैंने कोशिश की थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच मीनाक्षी जी इट्स नाइस यू से मैंने कोशिश की दैट इज वॉट मास्टर so uh, we have taken uh, very little only the first question with uh, we have taken from uh, sinet's letter and if anybody has uh, any points to discuss on this you may please unmute and speak now in this letter there will be many concepts about what is immortality and what does it mean to remember and what is the uh, when you say a person is immortal so what is the duration 
we are referring to. So all these kinds of concepts will be answered in this letter number 70C. Uh, any questions from anybody? Sheetal ji? Yes, yes. <coughs> namaste. Uh, namaste, namaste. Uh, may I ask uh, uh, any name, can you give any name of our lunar pitri and the solar pitri? Name of what? Sorry, please repeat that. Lunar, lunar pitri yes. and solar pitri. Means, uh, can we uh, know them uh, by any name? Uh, I don't think any particular, to my knowledge, uh, there is no particular names given to them. It is only mentioned that what are the principles they furnish in mankind. So the lunar pitris, they, uh, through their chaya, they have given us our uh, astral body, the lingashari. And the solar pitris, they, are, they were the Manasputras who incarnated in this race and they provided man with the activated Manas, that is the fifth principle. But uh, names I do not know uh, in my knowledge. Maybe Pradeepji, if you know anything about particular beings in these two hierarchies. So I think that is it. Okay, okay, ma'am. And uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, knew something about Lechela, but can you please revise uh, uh, about the Lechela? Okay, just uh, upfront, I can tell you, uh, actually, there is a big article on that, accepted Chela and Lechela, but upfront, I can just tell you, uh, Lechela is anybody who uh, who the master was communicating with and giving them the teachings. See, for actually entering uh, into this stream and becoming an accepted Chela, that person has to be a sannyasi and he has to follow a very strict spiritual discipline. But all these people, they were uh, householders, they were married, senate, Hume, everybody. And they were not living the kind of lifestyle which was required for this spiritual discipline. And even though this was the case, the Chohans had agreed, they had permitted Senate to, uh, sorry, they had permitted Mahatma KH and Mahatma M to communicate with them and give them a little bit of knowledge as much which was feasible. So that is why they were called lay chelas. They were not accepted chelas in the actual sense. For accepted chela, the discipline is much, much stricter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. May I ask you one more question? Yes, Shitanji, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in uh, Thought Power, its uh -huh. culture, uh, this book may uh, likha hai ki uh, astral body after death of any person, that astral body gets changes. It uh, closes itself from the uh, outer side. So, uh, can you ex uh, explain a little more in that? Uh, what do you mean by changes, astral body changes? Mm, ch changes means uh, uh, there are some uh, changes taken place in the astral body when the person dies. So it, it is, uh, uh, it, she is like uh, covering, uh, it gets wrapped. Okay, see changes. what uh -huh. I understand about these states of death. Um, yeah. Every plane has seven oh, subplanes. Okay. The lower subplanes, their vibrations are more coarse and the higher subplanes will have more subtle vibrations of that same plane. So now let us consider the astral plane, which the uh, being or that individual will enter after his physical death. So the lower vibrations of the astral plane, they will be all the baser instinct and uh, the negative feelings of greed, anger, jealousy. And so these are all the coarse vibrations of the astral plane. So they form a shell-like structure, that matter. It forms like a shell-like structure. And uh, see, you would have seen or heard many people, they say they have a feeling as if they are passing through a tunnel. In the cases of near-death experience, they have mentioned that they have this feeling of passing through a dark tunnel. And at the end of which they can see a light. I'm sure many of you must have heard this. 
So it is nothing but this astral matter, the lower astral matter, which comprises the astral body of that person. It, it, is, uh, it has formed this shell-like structure. So that is what I think you are mentioning about how the astral body changes. Yes, but, um, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Please continue. There was a lot of sound coming from outside. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sheetal ji, did, I hope you got your answer. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, any other question or any other thing somebody wants to add? Okay, then we'll bring this session to a close and we will continue with the letter in our next session. So thank you so much everybody for joining and we'll close the session with the closing prayer. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Purnam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Lokaha Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschit Tukabhag Bhave Om Shanti Shanti Thank you all for joining. Namaste. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.